then I'll let everyone in. And as you know, the drill, I'll give the basic background and you'll pick it up. We have 37 in the waiting room. We had 111 registered. We've been drawing about half of what we registered. But I'm going to open this up. Welcome, welcome, welcome in everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything that we do. Uh, we are uh, pleased today to have Bill Nolan, uh, a lawyer of some repute and an elder lawyer of, gosh, nearly 40 or over 40 years, who frequently speaks with us, who was kind enough today to design a presentation that we asked him to do on simple estate planning. And we asked Bill to do this because it was asked of us by a former attendee to one of these care concierge CEU courses. And I, I raised that point to say that we try and meet your needs uh, and what is it actionable and on the tip of your tongue when we choose our topics. And so I do wanna ask you in the evaluation today, if you will list any topics of note to you. If you've been with us before, you know that we have an online evaluation, which must be completed in order to receive credit for this hour. We are accredited to offer 1.0 contact hours, or contact hour rather, for this course by both the Board of Nursing as well as the Board of Social Work for the state of Alabama. If you're from another state, these should be uh, you know, transmissible from state to state, they generally are. Um, our evaluation link, I will read to you, those of you who are traveling or in the car or on your phone and unable to see the screen, I've typed it into the screen for you. And I'll read it now for you to make note of it. And please remember that this, this evaluation is password protected. We'll give the password out at the end today. And by doing it this way, you can, if you are a social worker, list this course as a live course, a face-to-face -face course, classroom course. Uh, and that's why we do our evaluation the way, the way that we do when we offer a password which I'll give later today. The link, however, which I'll give you now, is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash, all uppercase letters, L7Y, T as in Tom, S, J, 9. That is our evaluation link today. Our course is Simple Estate Planning, a topic suggested by one of you. I hope you'll leave your evaluation uh, topics with us for the future. Uh, and now, without uh, too much more to say, uh, I, oh, let me say this first. I want to thank everyone on this call and everyone who's been on previous calls, and I see a lot of names that I know. Our business is growing because of you, because you're giving our names out to clients or patients, friends and family, and I so much appreciate it and just want to take a moment to thank you. And now I'll introduce our speaker, uh, who I consider a friend and, and certainly a, a very good educator, uh, Bill Nolan with the Alabama Elder Law Group. So, Bill, if you will, share with us today's simple estate plan. Great. Yeah, looking forward to it. Thanks, Sean. Um, appreciate everybody tuning in. I noticed when people were, were registering, there are a few out-of-town area codes that popped up. So, if you are out of town somewhere else in Alabama and you don't have a local lawyer you, you know, uh, shoot me an email, call me, whatever. Uh, chances are I know someone in your area who can help you locally, although we'd, we'd be happy to help you up here. You know, we can, we can work all over the state of Alabama and, and frequently do. So uh, either way, I'm happy to help either you find a resource locally or happy to help. Today, we're going to talk about estate planning because that's 
it, it seems simple to us, to, to lawyers, but uh, it, it's confusing to, to individuals. And I, for the life of me, I, I, I can't figure out why. You know, because when we say estate planning, uh, we mean something very specific. And apparently for people who didn't go to law school and didn't take the bar exam, they hear something different. So today we're going to talk about it. We're going to uh, talk about what it means and, and what it does for you. In fact, every time I go to a CLE myself, I look at the, the title and the topic, you know, and the agenda, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, it's a not in it for me, because that's really what it boils down to, not how interesting the stuff is, but what's the takeaway for the people who attend it, right? What, what can you leave there with that's more valuable than what you showed up with? So that's, I'm hopeful, that's what we're going to be delivering uh, uh, during this presentation. Uh, as usual, if you have any questions, I think you can, you can post those, and then we'll go over those at the end of the, the presentation, see if we can answer them for you. Uh, Estate planning, well, um, I'm going to move this bar so I can see the, the PowerPoint myself, see what I'm supposed to be saying. Uh, what's it all about? You know, what, what do we mean when we say estate planning? Well, uh, estate planning is this process, this, this uh, system uh, that allows you to protect yourself if you're disabled, if you're sick, if you're injured. Dementia is a very common uh, situation that occurs. You know, you, you get to a point in life where you can't make financial decisions anymore. You can't make healthcare decisions anymore. And yet those decisions have to be made. So having a proper estate plan allows you now, while you're able to, to choose that person and to give them some instructions about what you might want. Uh, an estate plan also helps you distribute your assets after you're gone. And that's what most people think of when they think of estate planning. They think of a will. That is, what happens after I'm gone? Who gets my stuff? Uh, and it certainly uh, deals with that, it lets you decide who not only gets your stuff, but who doesn't. And it lets you choose the person to manage that process. Sometimes they're called executors. Sometimes they're called personal representatives. But it allows you now to make those decisions so that people don't have to guess what those decisions might be down the road. Estate planning also lets you provide for any minor children you might have. Uh, uh, my son's 31, so it, it's not a concern I have any longer, but but many of you have minor children at home, or maybe your uh, your child has a minor child, you're a grandparent now, uh, so maybe this will be something that you can take home and, and talk to them about, what they should be doing as a young parent, in other words. Another benefit to having a good estate plan is you can possibly avoid probate. Probate is this court-administered process where the court oversees the distribution of the deceased person's stuff, their assets, their real estate, bank accounts, and so on, so that those assets get to either the right people. If you have a will, they're called beneficiaries. If you don't have a will and you've died, they're called next of kin or heirs. Uh, they want The court wants to make sure the right people get it, the wrong people don't get it, creditors are paid, bills are paid, taxes are paid, and so on. Probate takes about a year, maybe longer, Cost four or five thousand dollars, and you can avoid it entirely if you want to. But many people just don't. Having a good estate plan might allow you to avoid probate, save money, and save time. And another thing that uh, having a good estate plan might do is to help your. Uh, we've all seen it, you know, where uh, a, a person will get divorced, or maybe they'll lose a spouse and go a few years and then meet someone new and and get married fairly late in life. You know, when they have uh, children of their own, they have wealth of their own, and they want to protect their own children. Uh, each of the spouses wants to protect their own children. Well, having a good estate plan allows you to protect the children from your first marriage if you're in a second, third, fourth, fifth marriage uh, as well. Otherwise, you know, it, it's a it's a roll of the dice. Who goes first and who goes second? And whose kids get, get the inheritance? Um, so that's what, what we're trying to accomplish. That's what having a good estate plan allows you to do as an individual. It is a system, you know, hospitals have protocols they put in place to, to be consistent about the way they approach a problem. And that's what this is. It's a consistent approach. It allows, it's traditional. You know, everybody has some, some vague notion about what a will is and what a will does. And by the way, in the movies and in novels, you'll often 
oftentimes see this formal reading of the will that takes place after a person's died. You know, the lawyer contacts all the family and says the reading of the will is going to be next week at noon at my office. And everybody's around this big conference table and the lawyer unseals this will and reads it to everybody and they find out what they've inherited. That never happens in real life. It never happens. So if you lose a family member, don't expect there to be a reading of the will. It's just not going to take place. It, it makes for great drama, but it, it's not, it, it's nothing that people do in this century anymore. Uh, so estate planning is a traditional way to approach a problem that is how to take care of someone after they're dead or after they've lost capacity. It's universally accepted. You know, it's virtually the same in Alabama and New York and California. I mean, there's some specific differences, but it, in general, it's the same process. It's understood by the courts. So if you uh, uh, go into any probate court in Alabama, they understand exactly what's going on. And it's understood by banks. So if you're working with the power of attorney and you're trying to pay your mom's bills, um, they understand exactly what they're looking at when they see a power of attorney, for example. Credit unions, real estate agents, they all understand that. And lastly, it's, it's understood by the healthcare industry. You know, if you have this system in place, this decent estate plan, the doctors, the nurses, the hospital, the dentist, the pharmacy, they're not going to give you any problem because they understand that you have everything you need to make those decisions for somebody else. So it makes a lot of sense to have a good estate plan in place, at least in my opinion, it does. Okay, so who has an estate plan? That's always a question we get with older folks because they might come to me and say, I don't need, I don't need to pay good money to put down on paper what everybody in the family knows they're going to get anyway. Well, that kind of comment shows a fundamental lack of understanding on the part of the client. A will does, in fact, tell people what they get, but it does a lot more than that. Some people say, well, I'm just going to write it down and, and everybody you know, is going to honor my wishes. Well, it doesn't work that way. Uh, it has to meet certain formalities to be acknowledged by the court. Or people will often copy a will that they've, they've had, I don't know, from a parent, and they just change the names, copy it down, and don't know what they're doing. So mistakes can be made, and those mistakes can be very costly, it can cost you a lot more than paying a lawyer to draft the will in the first place. So this is an order, in my opinion, of who needs a will from the most important to the least important. And it might be a shock to you because, in my opinion, the elderly are the people who don't need a will nearly as badly as the people at the top. And the reason is young parents are having to make decisions about who is going to raise our minor children. The elderly don't have to worry about that. Young parents are going to have to make a decision who is going to manage our infant's inheritance for the next 21 years. Who's going to be around? Who can do that? The elderly don't have to make that decision. Um, young parents have to decide between both sets of grandparents. How do you weigh that? Who do you choose the, to be the, the guardian of the minor children? Well, the elderly don't have to worry about that. Um, young parents, it's, it's imperative that they have a decent estate plan. What happens more often than I like to see, more often than, than I wish it, it, it happened, young parents with minor children, something happens. They, they both get killed, plane crash, car wreck, whatever. They've never made the decision about who's going to raise those minor children. The, the wife, normally she thinks, well, my parents are the best suited to raise the kids. Well, the husband feels the same way about his parents, but nobody really knows Who's the, who, who's the choice? So now you have two sets of grandparents battling it out in court over who's going to be the guardian of these, these grandchildren. Well, nobody knows the answer. So the court's going to make a decision. And whoever the winner is will most likely never let those grandchildren see the loser. That's not a, a scenario that anybody would want to force on grandparents. And yet that's what's happening when young parents don't have a decent estate plan in place. Also, Young parents, most of them are, you know, they're up to their eyeballs in debt right now. You know, the house has a mortgage on it. There's a car payment and all that. They don't really think they have anything to leave, but they have IRAs, 401ks, equity in the home, value of the, the bank accounts and 
whatever the cars are with. Plus, if something happens to those young parents, it's most likely not a result of a natural death. It's a plane crash. It's a car wreck. It's something that creates liability on somebody else's part. Well, their estate might be worth millions of dollars as a result of their death. That money is an inheritance for the miners. Who's going to manage that for the miners? Because the miners can't. Well, the court's going to give that money to what's called a conservator. If you don't name that person in your will, the court's going to appoint somebody, and it's most likely not going to be a grandparent. You can say, I want my child's inheritance to be managed by my brother, who's a financial advisor. Well, that's great, but you have to say that in your will because the court's not going to assume that. So that's why it's so important for young parents to have a decent estate plan. If you have kids who are young parents or if you're a young parent yourself, please talk to your spouse about getting something done. It doesn't have to be with us. I'd love to do it for you, but it doesn't have to be with us. It just needs to be done. Uh, it's, it's a tremendous source of peace of mind for uh, not only the young parents, but for their parents, the grandparents, who don't want to have to fight over the grandkids. Uh, newly married, I think, is the next most important uh, uh, group. Uh, you know, if you're newly married, you might want your spouse to now make decisions about managing your money or managing your health care. Um, that's normally the way it works, but uh, that's the chances are that your parents are still going to see their role more actively than maybe they should. If you set it out in, in an estate plan, it's clear that you don't want your parents to continue making health care decisions. making health care decisions for you. In that case, you definitely need to put it in writing in an estate plan. So, um, uh, and, and you know, you're worth, you're worth something as an individual. You've got your 401k, your IRA, your car, whatever you came into the marriage with. You might want that to go to your spouse. You might want it to go to a sibling, but you need to be specific. Courts are not going to assume uh, anything unless you tell them what you want done with your stuff. And here's another one at this time of year, especially this is important. Families whose kids are off to college. You know, mom and dad have been making medical decisions for their child since that child was born. For the next 19 years, there's no question about who makes decisions about, about your child's medical treatment, medical care, what hospital they go to and all that. But when they turn 19, they're adults now. You lose the right to make those medical decisions. You lose the right to know what's going on with your child medically. And you might not even have the right to know if they're in a hospital uh, without their permission. So it comes as a shock to parents whose kids are off to college. Your kid goes to Auburn and does something stupid. And I know college kids don't do that, but let's just assume they do. And your, your, your child's now in the hospital in Auburn. And you call the hospital and say, I'm... Joe's mom, how's he doing? Well, the hospital might not even tell you if Joe's a patient there because he's 19. Well, you can fix all that. Before your kid leaves for college, he or she can sign an Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare and a HIPAA waiver and leave you in charge of medical decisions even long after they're 19. So very simple to do, almost free is so cheap to do. And yet so many families whose kids are off to college are obsessed with matching sheets and pillowcases and not what's really important, that is continuing to make medical decisions for their child. The next in line, I think, are widows and widowers. You know, if, if with a married couple, typically assets will pass to the surviving spouse without any court involvement whatsoever. You know, excuse me, Bill. Uh, yes, sir. Jennifer Calder had uh, asked you to repeat the name of the document for a college student. Oh, we're going to get to that in more detail later, but it's called the Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare and a HIPAA waiver. They're two separate documents. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. But thanks for asking. You know, assets when a person dies pass one of three ways. They pass to a joint owner, and many married couples own their homes jointly. Or they might have their bank accounts jointly, or they might have their cars jointly. So when the first spouse dies, it automatically passes to the second surviving spouse without anybody having to do anything. The second way assets pass when a person dies is if there's a beneficiary on the asset. People think of life insurance, IRAs, annuities. 
those uh, all have beneficiaries. Chances are your spouse is your beneficiary. So your spouse at your death files the beneficiary claim form and those assets pass to them without probate. The third way assets pass, that is if you don't have a beneficiary or a joint owner, they pass under your will if you have one and by what they call intestacy if you don't have one. Well, when a married couple, when the first spouse dies, chances are everything's going to flow to the surviving spouse. But now the surviving spouse is a widow or a widower, and it's not that easy any longer. So a widow or widower really needs to have an estate plan much more so than they might have needed it as a couple. And the mistake people make is, I didn't have to do anything when my husband died, so why should my kids have to do anything when I die? Well, that's not a smart assumption to make. Uh, so if you have anybody who's a widow or widower, they really need to talk to a lawyer about putting a plan together. And the last and least important of all are the elderly. Yeah, the chances are they're going to need a, an estate plan sooner than maybe the rest of them in here. But many elderly people have already added their children to their assets, you know, like uh, a TOD on bank accounts, or they might have put their child on on bank accounts as a co-signer. They might have used a life estate on their real estate. They might have sold their real estate already. So there's less to deal with late in life than there is on everybody above here. Although I still think the elderly need to have a plan, if for no other reason than to avoid problems and misunderstandings with all the kids and grandkids. Um, so have I convinced you yet? It's important to have this in place. I'm sure you're one of those groups. You're either a young parent, you're either a, a, a parent with kids off to school, you're either a second marriage. Anyway, I'm sure you fell into one of those categories. The first well, and most, go ahead. I'm sorry, me. Bill. We, we've got a series of questions, actually, and you may you may get to them, or but but if not, I wanted to ask. Uh, Ms. Williams has three questions. One is it necessary to have a will and a living trust? No, it's not. It's it's important. Okay. It's smart to, but it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, second question of hers is, do you have to pay a monthly fee to the lawyer who maintains your living trust will? You shouldn't. We don't. We don't do that. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a transaction. It's a document that's created. There shouldn't be any kind of monthly charge or retainer fee or anything like that at all. Now, there, there would be, as you know, Bill, charge if, if you had someone who was working as your conservator. Mm -hmm. And they have the power to charge a fee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then her third question is, where does one obtain an advanced directive and HIPAA form living in Alabama? Sure. The uh, State Bar, Alabama State Bar website uh, has those blank forms somewhere. I've seen them. I don't, I can't tell you exactly where they are, but you could probably poke around alabar.org and find them. Now, when we do the rest of the documents, you know, the power of attorney health um, uh, will and, and uh, so on, we include all the healthcare documents as part of that plan ourselves. So you wouldn't have to create those yourself. Um, it's important not just to have the document, but to have it completed correctly, uh, because otherwise it's not going to do you much good. So we make sure that it's completed correctly. And, and uh, another thing that's important is where that document is being kept. You know, when we do our document prep for our clients, we make sure that we have your proxy's phone number, cell phone number, and we include that in the document because it's nice for the hospital to know that your daughter, Susie, is going to make medical decisions for you if you can't make them. But if they can't reach Susie, how are they going to get that decision? So we want to make sure they can reach her. And then we give copies of all the healthcare documents, the signed, executed copies to the client and tell them to take those to the doctor's office, their doctor's office, and have it scanned into their chart, just like their x-rays and blood work. So it becomes part of your medical uh, chart and can be accessed when necessary. That's the way we do it. Um, and Bill, uh, I forgot my question. Uh, that's embarrassing. Oh, uh, what is the typically what would someone expect to pay in Alabama for the preparation of the advanced directive and HIPAA form? 
Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't, I've never shopped what other lawyers charge. I, I have no clue about what they charge. I would guess, um, I would guess they're probably a little more expensive in the Birmingham area than say in the outlying areas. Um, we would rarely, if ever, simply do a power of attorney or a healthcare set of documents or a will because each one deals with a very important aspect of estate planning. So we include all those together. Um, it would almost be malpractice to just do a will for someone and not deal with the other aspects of that, in my opinion. We charge, I think it's $800 to a, for an individual for everything. It's a one-time charge. There's no monthly charge or anything like that. Uh, so for us, it's $800 for everything. Um, That's and, amazing, y'all. If you haven't priced legal work and you're on this call, Bill, who's excellent, uh, doesn't value himself as much <laughs> perhaps as other lawyers value themselves. His pricing is generally, I've found, you know, a half or, or less than his competitors and the work is better. Oh, well, I appreciate you saying that. I, I'll have to reevaluate here at year end. And <laughs> get it while it's uh, get it while it's hot or whatever. Right. Um, so estate planning really falls into three major areas. That is, what can be done to take care of me while I'm unable to take care of myself? We talked about that a minute ago. And that could be financial or medical. And then what happens to my stuff after I'm gone? Um, uh, and that's the will. So the, the three would be the power of attorney for the financial, advanced directive for healthcare for the medical, and the last will and testament or a trust for what happens to your stuff. The first and most important is the power of attorney. It's the financial document. It's the document that lets you choose who you want to manage your financial affairs if you can't do it. And if you're in the social work industry, if you're in the, the, the nursing home, assisted living industry, the power of attorney is already. It is vitally important. If you're trying to get somebody qualified for Medicaid and you don't have a power of attorney, it can be very difficult to get them qualified. So what you're doing here is you're basically appointing a manager or a, a secretary, glorified secretary to help you manage your affairs. It could be making deposits at the bank or accessing a safety deposit box, or it could be um, writing checks for you. It could be uh, keeping your car tag renewed, keeping the power bill on, uh, or selling your house. If you go to a nursing home and the house is just a money pit. Uh, you can appoint one or more people to manage your, your affairs. They're called agents uh, under a power of attorney. They, the power of attorney can be very broad or very narrow in its authority. Some people will do, a, a, I don't know if you've ever bought a car, uh, but in that stack of documents, they always ask you to sign. There will be an appointment of power of attorney in there, appointing the car dealer with the specific power to apply for title or uh, uh, for you or change title for you. I don't know if you've noticed that, but that's a very specific power of attorney, for example. Um, you can give somebody power of attorney for the rest of your life, or it can be limited to amount of time, um, uh, you know, for the next year or while you're in Europe or whatever it is. Um, and it's always revocable and it terminates at your death. So and that's something that people always mistake is they keep acting under a power of attorney after the person's died and it doesn't work that way. So a power of attorney is a critically important document. If you don't have one, you have to go through a conservatorship, which takes over a month. It costs thousands of dollars. You have to be bonded and you have to report to the court at least every three years about what's going on in the conservatorship. So it can be, you know, you can avoid all that with a good power of attorney. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, I've had people say, I will, I'll go ahead and sign a power of attorney when I need one. I, I, I almost enjoy it when they say that to me, because I say, well, tell me, how will you know when you need one? Will it be after you've had the heart attack, the stroke, after you've had an accident? How will you know when you need one? And will you have the ability to sign one once you've had that stroke or that heart attack or you develop dementia? I'm just curious how that works. Um, it, we, we don't have the luxury of knowing when we might need it. You know, if we all knew when we needed, when, when we were going to need our health insurance, we would wait until the day before we were going to have the operation to, uh, to apply for health insurance, but it doesn't work that way. 
Uh, that's the same way it works with, with the powers of attorney. You need to have it in place even though you might not need it. The next set of documents is what we lump together in what we call healthcare documents. The uh, most important is what's known as the Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare. Now, that's the document that says, um, if it, some people call it a living will still. Uh, some people call it a medical power of attorney or a health care power of attorney or a health care proxy. Um, here in Alabama, it's called the Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare, And it's a combination of two documents, what used to be called a living will and what's now known as an appointment of health care proxy. The first part is where you're telling the world and your family, if two doctors agree that my condition is hopeless, you know, I'm going to die in the near future without the uh, administration of artificial life support, I do or do not want to be kept alive artificially. Uh, and it's your choice. There's no wrong answer, but you're making a decision that you don't want your kids to have to make for you. You're doing them a huge favor by making that decision. Nobody wants to make a decision about mom or dad or a spouse or a child even. Do I want to keep them alive artificially or not? It's, you know, because you'll always be haunted that I make the right decision if, you know, when the person dies. So you get to make it for them and take them off the hook. Now all they're doing is following your instructions. So that's what the Alabama Advanced Directive for Healthcare does, is it lets you tell the world to what extent you want the medical community to go to if two doctors agree that you're either terminally ill or permanently unconscious. The other part of that document, the healthcare proxy, is where you're saying, if I'm ever in a position where I can't speak for myself and medical decisions have to be made. Now, you don't have to be at death's door. You don't even have to be in the hospital. You could be at home and you could be under the care of a home care person and not be able to speak because you've got a, you've had a stroke maybe, or you have a uh, uh, ventilator. Um, you're saying, I want my daughter, my son, my husband, my wife to make those medical decisions for me until I'm able to speak for myself again. Now, this is an important document because if you have kids, you have four or five kids, you're always going to have one bossy kid. And that bossy kid is going to assume they get to make medical decisions for you. And you may not want that bossy kid to be the one making decisions. Well, if you don't state otherwise, that bossy child is going to be the one making decisions. So you have the choice here. You can decide who's going to do it. But if you don't, it's not only going to be confusing for the doctors as to who's in charge, that is, who's, who's the one they should be talking to, it's confusing for the rest of the kids because they don't know who you might want. So it's so important to have it, and it's not that big of a deal to put it in place. In addition to the advanced directive for healthcare and the appointment of healthcare proxy, we do a self-standing, uh, uh, self I guess you'd call it, HIPAA waiver, and it basically says, I understand that my medical history, my diagnosis, uh, my prescriptions are confidential. Nobody gets to know those, those specifics, but I am giving the hospital, my doctors, nurses, dentists, pharmacists permission to discuss freely my medical situation with the following people. And then you list whoever you would want to be able to call the hospital and say, and say, hey, I'm... Um, you know, my, I'm the nephew of so-and-so, just call him to see how he's doing. Well, the hospital will tell you how, how he's doing if you're on that HIPAA waiver. If you're not, they're probably not going to tell you. It doesn't give people decision-making authority. It merely gives them access to information. We also use what's called a dementia directive. It's a fairly new document here in Alabama. It's a document that only goes into effect if you have advanced dementia. So you have to have dementia. It doesn't apply to Lou Gehrig's, you know, COPD, only dementia. And only if your dementia is at the level of six or seven, which is the terminal end of the scale. And it only goes into effect if you're at an institution. It could be memory care, it could be assisted living, might be skill care. And it only goes into effect if you have now decided you no longer want to eat food willingly. Well, that poses a problem for a facility because their primary job is to keep you alive, right? They're gonna feed you. If you're not eating willingly, well, they're gonna figure out some way to get you fed. The family, on the other hand, sees their mom or dad being treated in a less than fully respectful manner by being fed against their will, and it's upsetting to them. 
So the facility says, look, either we're going to feed her unwillingly or you're going to have to find her another place to live. Well, that's tough to find somebody at level six or seven with a dementia uh, diagnosis. This merely says that, and you sign it now while you have the capacity. If I get to the point where I'm no longer communicating because of my advanced dementia and I lose interest in eating food willingly, I don't want to be fed against my will. Boom. It lets the facility off the hook. It lets your family know that's your decision. Now, that doesn't mean your family can't bring you Wendy's burgers every day if you want them. I mean, what's it going to do? Raise your cholesterol? Let's face it. Uh, you can eat what you want to eat, but you no longer have to eat what the hospital's giving you. An important document. We had a guy who's dead now, but he uh, he was a patient at a local facility for over a year. He had um, uh, Lewy body dementia. And he lost an interest in eating the food there. And I was looking at his his uh, his bills, his uh, credit card bills, because we did probate on his estate. And I see these charges literally every day at fast food places. You know, it might be Saul's Barbecue one day. It might be Milo's. It might be KFC. And I asked his brother, who was his conservator, what's the deal here? He was picking him up lunch every single day and taking it to him because his brother didn't want to eat the hospital food. Perfectly fine. He wanted to eat the, the sauce barbecue, but he didn't want to eat the, the stuff they were giving him at the facility. So it really does work. Um, all of your healthcare documents are lumped together, and we give you photocopies that go into your chart. Now, we, we can't put them there, but you can. So we'll say, this is these are photocopies. Take them to your doctor. Have them scanned into your chart. They'll follow you wherever you go. Uh, it has not only your appointment of proxy, that is, if I can't make decisions, I want my daughter to make those decisions. It gives the hospital a way to contact her. And there's a HIPAA waiver in there for the rest of the people in the family who you don't mind them knowing what's going on with you medically. Very important step, and it's one that's frequently overlooked uh, in the process, I think. The last and least important, in my opinion, set of documents you need for estate planning is the will itself. Well, let's face it, your stuff's going to get to somebody after your death. It might be the right people, it might be the wrong people, but it's going to get to some someone. You don't have to do anything to make that happen. A will only goes into effect at your death, though. So up until your death, uh, a will is not doing you any good at all, whereas the other documents, they're actually helping you while you're disabled but alive. That's why I think a will is really sort of lower in, in terms of importance, although people put a lot of value on their stuff uh, and want to make sure the right people get that stuff and the wrong people don't. So I understand how important it is. It's the one thing that generally brings people in here uh, rather than the power of attorney or health care. So what a will does not only distributes your stuff after you're gone, it appoints someone else to manage that process. Sometimes they're called executor. Sometimes they're called personal representative. Uh, if you have a trust, they're called trustee. Um, if you die without a will, the person's called an administrator. Their job is to make sure bills are paid, taxes are paid, and the right people get the stuff uh, under the right set of circumstances. If they don't, they're going to have to explain themselves to the probate judge. Um, probate, again, is this process that's administered by the court, it takes a year or more, Cost four or five thousand dollars. It's totally unnecessary. Uh, if there's a will, it's it's uh, a simple process, relatively speaking, and cheaper. If there isn't a will, it's called intestacy or intestate probate. It is much more expensive and takes a lot longer and requires a lot more interaction on the part of the lawyer, which means it's going to cost more. Um, so something to remember about having a will. It does not avoid the probate process. I can't tell you how many people say, well, we can avoid probate because mom had a will. I don't know where that comes from. If anybody ever tells you that, ask them what law school they graduated from because a will doesn't avoid probate. It makes It's a fast track through the process and it's cheaper, but you still have to jump through those hoops. Um, when you open probate, whether you have a will or not, you have to notify creditors. Uh, that's the law. Creditors for the first six months of the process, they have a right to get paid whatever they're owed. If they're the ambulance that took you to the hospital for the last time, if they're the doctor who treated you, even though you might not have made it, 
they get they're entitled to get paid. The hospital is entitled to be paid. The uh, um, you know your utilities at home, the mortgage, the car payment, those are all creditors. Um, most seniors don't have a lot of debt when they die, but I've seen uh, people come in here who they they've been uh, asked to co-sign for their grandkids on a car payment, and the grandkid promptly quits paying the bill. And now Ford Motor Credit suing this 80-year-old person because they co-signed on this loan, and uh, you know they owe forty thousand dollars that nobody was expecting. Uh, so it can happen, really can. Um, wills can be challenged out there by anybody who's out there who thinks that they're not getting their fair share. And uh, wills can be challenged now, maybe not successfully ultimately, but even if it's an unsuccessful challenge, it's going to cost the estate a good bit of money to defend it. So those are some reasons why avoiding probate might make sense. I don't have to notify creditors. It's much harder to challenge uh, uh, the situation if you can avoid probate than if you go through probate. Uh, just things to think about that we talk about with the client when they're here. Um, you know, with a will, you can take care of minor kids. Without a will, DHR is going to get involved. Most people wouldn't want their kids to be, not that there's anything wrong with DHR. You guys do a good job. It's a tough assignment you have, I understand. But, you know, most families, if you ask them, would you prefer a loved one in the family taking care of, of your kids or DHR? I think most people would say, ah, you know, I'd rather my family take care of the kids than DHR. I understand that. You can set up a testamentary trust in a will that manages your children's inheritance until they're old enough to be responsible to, to receive it. You can appoint the child's guardian, the person who's going to raise the kids and give them some instruction about what you might want. Uh, and you can avoid that conflict between grandparents, you know, that, that would happen if you didn't have a will with specific appointments. So a will is really important, again, if you have minor kids. Some people like the flexibility of a trust, and we really don't have time to get into a trust much here, but I'm happy to talk about it in some future uh, uh, webinar, if you like. A trust avoids probate, which is great. Saves you four or $5,000 in a year of time. It also avoids this gap between your death and the court getting involved on the probate process itself. And that gap could be two or three weeks. It could be two or three months. During that gap, nothing is happening with your estate. So sometimes the house payment doesn't get made. The car payment doesn't get made. The utilities don't get paid and, and so on. And it can create really big time problems. Uh, a trust avoids that gap. It's much less formal and it's very difficult to challenge a trust uh, because the only people who have a right to, to see a trust are the beneficiaries. So if someone says, I think I'm beneficiary of the trust that Mr. Smith did, if they're not, they don't even get to see Mr. Smith's trust. And if they are a beneficiary, well, they get it, they have a right to see it. So um, having a trust is a very good way to keep the specifics of your estate confidential. Some people have come to us from smaller counties. I'm working with somebody from uh, Monroeville right now. And they don't want to do a will-based plan in Monroe County because they say everybody at the courthouse is going to be poking their nose in their will. And they don't like that. They want to do a revocable trust so nobody has a right to see that. Jefferson County, it would be hard to, to go through everybody's estate plan at the courthouse. But in the smaller counties, I can imagine that could happen. Um, with second marriage planning, you, know, you each spouse can protect that respective spouse's children's inheritance. Imagine this, if you would. Two people who each have, have been widowed and each have their own children and each have their own wealth that they inherited from their first marriage. They meet, maybe they're 70 years old now, maybe 80. And they want to, you know, they don't want to live in sin, so they decide to get married. And, and they get married, and it's their understanding, and maybe their wish that when they died, their kids would get their stuff, and their spouse's kids would get their spouse's stuff. Makes sense, right? Simple. Well, it doesn't work that way in reality. The first spouse that dies, well, usually 
the first spouse that dies says, I want my surviving spouse to be taken care of for the rest of his or her life. And then the money would go to these respective sets of kids. Well, your surviving spouse can change his or her will after your death. Your surviving spouse can get remarried again. And now you've got another person in the mix. Uh, your kids might not even know when their stepdad or stepmom dies 10 years later. So there are ways to do it the right way, but doing nothing is definitely the wrong way if you're looking at a marriage plan put in place. Prenups don't provide any benefit to the kids by themselves. And by the way, prenups don't provide any protection in a Medicaid scenario. People have come to me and said, well, we have, we have a prenup, ironclad prenup. It was done by one of those law firms downtown, ironclad. So if either of us have to go to a nursing home, well, only their assets are going to be at risk for the, you know, for the nursing home. Well, uh -uh. Medicaid doesn't see that as valid. If you marry somebody and they have to go to a nursing home, your assets are on the line, just like their assets are. Your prenup is, is, is ineffective when it comes to paying for nursing home care when Medicaid's involved. Just some good news to end our webinar on. Uh, if you have a second marriage and you have a prenup, there are other things you can do to protect your respective assets in the event of a nursing home stay and a Medicaid application, but the prenup by itself ain't gonna cut it. So that's uh, that's pretty much our plan. I saved about five, 10 minutes here at the end so we could answer any questions you might have. I know we've blown through a lot and I apologize for the speed at which we've gone through this, but there was a lot to cover in an hour. If you ever need me to, to dig deeper in any one of these areas, uh, happy to do so. Uh, but this is kind of like an overview of the process and why it's important to each of you. So if we can help you, um, you can, here's my uh, phone number and our website. We've got a pretty good blog with a lot of all of these things talked about on the blog. Um, and uh, feel free to poke around in there if you like, or call us if we can help you, we'll be delighted to. Thank you so much, Bill. It was, it, it was a lot of information, but I thought you were very thorough and covered it very well. And it was really surprising to me to see the order of persons for whom these documents are most necessary because it was exactly reverse of what I would have thought and probably other people. Uh, there, Ms. Johns asked if you travel to North Alabama. You know, I don't. When I was younger and uh, I had to fight for clients, I guess, I traveled a good bit more and, and actually spoke a good bit more. And now it's... Uh, all I can do to, to keep my head above water here at the office. But there are some lawyers up in uh, North Alabama I can recommend. Uh, on the Northwest side, Tom Minnetree is good. On the Northeast side, Turning Point Legal is good. And in the middle, uh, Blake West is in Coleman and he's really good as well. And there's another lawyer who's starting out who might be good uh, in um, Huntsville. And his name is Zachary Anderson. He's with the firm Brodowski uh, and Miller, and he's in Huntsville. Uh, There's also Doug. Uh, he's the conservator. Uh, what is his last name? He's well known in Huntsville. Mm -hmm. um, there is um, another question. Ms. Wiley asked, what document is recommended to protect a person's home if they enter the nursing home? Yeah, that's a great question. And Medicaid planning is a whole different topic. And we could spend over an hour talking about Medicaid planning alone. And, and in fact, I think we did. Didn't Pam and I spend several Oh, yeah, we probably have three three courses that you and Pam Strickland of Medicaid Application Processing Services or MAPS have done. So if you have those questions, go to YouTube and, and search within YouTube, Sean Barnes Care Patrol. You'll find my face comes up somewhere. Click on it. It'll be my channel. And you can find Bill and Pam Strickland on a number of courses with us. Uh, about Medicaid, but I, I don't think, did you answer the question yet, Bill? Well, um, the easiest, cheapest, and probably most effective way is a life estate deed. 
It's not for everybody, but it's it's fairly cheap. It's maybe three hundred dollars, and if it's in place for five years or more, the house in that life estate is protected from a Medicaid lien or a nursing home spin down. Um, it uh, has to be in place for five years, but after that, I mean, it's good for the rest of your life. The more expensive option would be a real estate trust. It's a good bit more flexible than a life estate deed. It still has the five-year look back on it as well, but it might provide more flexibility than the deed itself might. Uh, but if, if, you know, the cheapest is the life estate deed. And, and nothing that one could put in place, you could do and then expect any result and let until after waiting five years. I, I know I well, phrased there's, that. There are a couple of options. If you're, if a sibling moves into your home and takes care of you for a year or more, the house can be deeded to the sibling and avoid a Medicaid lien. If a child moves in with you and lives with you for two years or more, the house can be deeded to the child without a Medicaid lien attaching. Um, so those are a couple of other options. I, I'm not a big fan of the of those exceptions though, because they're always changing. And um, used to be it could be deeded outright and Medicaid just said, yeah, you, you, you beat us, congratulations. Now though, Medicaid says, yeah, we'll deed it to the child, but we're gonna keep a lien on it. So when the child sells it or dies, then we'll get our money back. So Medicaid's always putting their spin on that and uh, you never know what, what they might do next year uh, to, to limit that option. So then the, I guess the key to, to that is to plan. Is that? I think so. Plan ahead. Yeah. Planning ahead is, is a great, you know, we, we plan for a lot of things in life. You know, we plan for our vacations months in advance. If you've ever planned a wedding, you start planning those things two or three years in advance. Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up. I'll bet if you're in charge of Thanksgiving at your house, You've already planned who's going to be there, who's going to bring things, when it's going to happen and all that. And yet we don't put five seconds of planning into what's going to happen between our retirement and our death. And a lot of bad can happen. So it makes sense to plan for that time in our life. It's not going to do any damage to plan, but it might save your family a lot of heartache and certainly a lot of money. Uh, Alice Camp asked if you, Bill, ever provide services or consultations via Zoom. Sure. We we started doing Zoom right after COVID started and have kept up with Zoom. We, uh, from, from my perspective, phone calls and Zoom uh, contact with a client to keep them from having to drive over here. And if they like what they hear, uh, then we can set up a more formal second meeting to talk over specifics. So yeah, I'm a big fan of Zoom. As am I. Miss Calder wants you to know that she has ordered her family's Thanksgiving t-shirts already. She did it yesterday. <laughs> there, prove my point. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Will anyone else have questions for, for Bill? We've got him here. He's a lawyer. You know they charge by the hour, and we've got him for another 10 minutes if anyone has a question. And if not, I'll go ahead and let you know that our password for our evaluation, uh, which I will read again, is PLAN with a capital P. The link is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash, all uppercase letters, L7Y, T as in Tom, S, J, N, uh, nine, excuse me. Let me redo that one more time. All uppercase letters, L7Y, T as in Tom, S, J, nine. That is our link. Our password is capital P plan. Want to thank Bill Noland uh, again uh, for coming to us again with his knowledge. Is if you've seen our other uh, courses or you know of them, you know that Bill is, is an educator. Education is the heart of what he does as it is what we do. And I'm, I'm most appreciative and I know that you are to him for giving us this hour 
of his time. Please join us on Monday of next week. Uh, on the 28th, when Dr. Lindsay Elmore, a pharmacist, PharmD, will relay to us the current medications for diabetes. So that is a topic that was also asked and asked on several occasions by some of our attendees. So I'm hoping if that was your suggestion, that you'll be with us on Monday when Dr. Lindsay Elmore presents medications for diabetes. Um, and the password, Ms. Smith, is PLAN with a capital P-L-A-N. PLAN. Thank you, Ms. Helms, for posting that. Ms. Calder wants to revisit this class, Bill, so uh, I think that would be the equivalent of having takeaways is watch agains. Uh, is, is anything else you'd like to leave us with, Bill, before we go? No. I, you know, there are a lot of lawyers who, who um, do estate planning in addition to personal injury, divorce, criminal defense, real estate closings, bankruptcies, all that. I don't think it costs any more to use a lawyer who specializes in estate planning than it does to use a lawyer who does a wide range of, of practices. I do think that you're going to get a higher level of service if you use somebody who specializes in an area. So if you are looking for someone try to limit your your search to people who do estate planning as a specialty and not just one of many things they do. And you might even limit your search to the Alabama elder law, elder care law firm, which is Bill's brainchild. And again, he's been doing this work since 1982, far longer than the majority uh, who, who also practice. Yeah, Thank you. Again, you Bill. Don't remind what? me. Don't remind me of how old I am, man. Come on. Oh, well, I'm right up there with you. <laughs> Things seem to start falling off about age 50, and, uh, and I'm, I'm six years into it. So uh, I will uh, continue to hope good health for you, Bill, and everyone else on the call. Lots of good, uh, fabulous presentation. Very good. Great information. Uh, I think everyone is... Uh, got the link and the password. And so we will call an end to today. Thank you again, Bill. We look forward to Pleasure. Uh, hoping you'll speak with us again in the future. Anytime. Thanks. Y'all have a good week. You too, Bill. Everybody take